up? I'm reliably informed that I'm terrible at pimping my stuff. So here I am, pimping my stuff. You can buy most of that shit that I make over at post-mort.com. Hope to see you there. Futurism is a lot like meteorology and a lot like economics. There's an awful lot of stuff that's just generally kind of unpredictable when you're trying to peek into the future and to predict what's going to happen. Same as there is with weather, the same as there is with economics. There's just so many chaotic factors coalescing. And that means you can only really predict things in a, in a very short-term window with any kind of accuracy, or in a very long-term window in a very general sense in terms of accuracy. Quite often, technological leaps, social changes, political changes, new technologies kind of throw us for a loop. Right? Events that are beyond the bounds of predictability, but have far-reaching effects, far more than we ever thought that they would. And there's a tendency, I think, amongst futurists to tend to concentrate on the positive outside of a few more uh, catastrophic areas of interest, um, such as climate change, for example, or the increasing amount of fear we see around the application of existing artificial intelligence technology and the potential for any future general intelligence technology. But we do have some ideas, some technologies that may be more predictable and it may be more valuable to predict the negative ways in which these things might be used and abused rather than the positive ways. We have an example of a really disruptive technology in the 1960s with the pill. Uh, simple, cheap, effective contraception for women off the back of which we had a huge sexual liberation movement, we had a whole huge women's rights movement, a lot of that, most even, depending who you ask, may have stemmed from the ease by which contraception then became available, how effective it was, and similarly loosening attitudes around abortion and so on. And so we can look at that as a disruptive technology in the way in which it's been used and some of the uh, unintended side effects, um, such as the, the, the pill is used to regulate periods, to help with all kinds of other things besides. There's a lot of positives, but a lot of people see it in a negative light. I don't personally agree with them, but we can see how they are horrified by the way in which that easy access to contraception has changed gender relations and the family and so on. And, and these are disruptive I happen to think it's in a positive way, they happen to think it's in a negative way. And we did have problems back then with concerns about overpopulation and so on, to which this appeared to be a godsend. But then we also are now facing down the problems of the baby boomers. They're ageing out of the workforce, they own a great deal of the money, a lot of the property and so on. and that sort of last relatively unregulated, <laughs> unself-regulated generation has created an enormous amount of strain on the lower generations where there aren't basically enough people to cover the costs, particularly since uh, wages haven't really risen in real terms in that period. But there's another disruptive technology around reproduction coming down the line, and by looking back to the 60s we might be able to see where that might take effect. And this is the idea of exobooms, basically being able to gestate a baby outside of your body so that you don't go through the pregnancy and all the issues that are associated with the pregnancy. It's not held within your body, it's farmed out to a machine or transgenic cattle have been proposed in the past where a fertilized egg would be taken and implanted in a transgenic cow and brought to term there, outside of the human body. We already have this technology to an extent. Prematurely born lambs have been grown and raised to birthing maturity in plastic bags, essentially. And it's only a matter of time before we can grow animals, and even potentially humans, outside the human body, inside one of these exoworms. Now there's a lot of positives to this. If women don't have to undergo the physical strain 
of, of carrying and birthing a child, it will have an effect on women's bodies. They will stay healthier later in life. There'll be no need to give birth and all the effects that that has. There'll be no need to carry the child and all the strain and effects that, that has. So the, uh, the death gap, the, the lifespan gap between men and women is likely to open up even more. So we'll see even more older women in the world if this becomes a widespread technology. There'll be no need for, for caesarean sections. Um, basically, you can carry on your life as you, as you prefer until your baby is ready to be collected, essentially until it's time for the bag to be opened. I imagine there'll be a lot of stigma towards this early on, but I think the, the sheer liberating capacity of it, the fact that you can avoid direct childbirth and all the strains on the body and so on, will inevitably make it into something that is sought after. Maybe initially only for the rich or for fashion models or for people whose work depends on their physicality or their appearance and so on, but more and more, as more and more time becomes pressing on, on people, I think this will become a much more viable or desirable option. So that there's a whole string of positives here. No one will have to have a child unless they want to. People can make themselves permanently incapable of reproduction once they've got their eggs or their sperm or whatever else in storage and then can choose to have a child at whatever time they want without any of the physical strain, the restricted working capacity or, or anything else. So this would be another great social liberation for women because one of the big differences that remains is that women have to carry children. And they, yeah, that's just a, a bold fact of biology that you cannot get around. And that does have certain effects when it comes to the world of work, earnings, all the rest of it. So that would probably narrow what little wage gap there actually is as well. But there's a dark side to all of this. If you can raise multiple fetuses in bags on, a, on an industrial scale, you know, absolutely clean, you can see anything that's going wrong, you can deal with it, you know, that there's it's so much easier to deal with as well. There's no chance of breech birth or any of these other problems. If you, if you can do that, if you can manufacture populations, why wouldn't some nations do that? Now, I'm not necessarily thinking about you know, liberal democratic nations, but places like China and so on, they have terrible trouble managing their population, hence the two-child policy and all the issues around that. And there's all the social stigma around having female children and so on. Can the people be trusted to reproduce in a manner that serves the state? That, that that's the big question in the or the government in these in these big authoritarian areas. Why not take reproduction out of the hands of the irresponsible people who won't have kids in the right proportion, won't necessarily breed enough at, at replacement levels, or just producing enough of a population to support the generations before them? Why let them do it? Why have that mess? when you could take it in and could centralize it, you could take people's eggs, take people's sperm, and produce populations to order. We need this many boys, this many girls. Or with genetic engineering in the offing, you know, we need this many boys with a tendency towards technical expertise. We need this many girls with a tendency towards science and medicine. Why shouldn't we make our population smarter or stupider? or stronger or more physically capable or better able to digest certain foods or whatever else why shouldn't we tailor our population that's going to be the question and you just know that some totalitarian bureaucratic state is going to do exactly that and it's a lot of people jokingly say that oh people should have to have a parenting license or or whatever else why not why not only allow children to people who can support those children properly, who can give them decent prospects? And if that doesn't provide enough children, why not also raise generations in crashes or lab grow kids and then give them out to people for adoption once they're in a, a safe, stable situation? That would have massively far-reaching effects on levels of crime and so on because your childhood is this massive formative factor 
So if some state stepped in and said, you are not allowed to have children unless you meet these particular criteria, not too dissimilar, <laughs> shall we say, to the uh, restrictions we put on immigration, point systems and so on. If you don't score a certain amount of points, you can't have kids. If you score over that amount of points, you can have multiple kids. Denying people the right to reproduction is obviously controversial and very negative in a lot of ways. But societally, it's, it's easy to see where the temptation might be to deny you know, welfare families with, with 12, quid, 12 kids the, the ability to have kids who are much more likely to grow up malnourished, underdeveloped, into criminality and poverty and so on. Why not just deal with poverty by eliminating the right of reproduction from people on the lower tiers? Yeah, it, it's it's easy to see how that could be sold, how it could be tempting to people. Uh, of course, Western liberal capitalist nations aren't completely immune to this. Couldn't private entities create their own populations? Couldn't they create their own consumer base? To an extent, you know, if you're if you're a company that sells a lot of baby goods, why not produce babies to consume those goods? Why not? raise people and then charge them for being raised indentured servitude in effect is that really that different to people going to university and getting into debt you didn't ask to be born but you have been and so you owe the company your your corporate parents was it ten thousand pounds a couple of years ago was estimated to be the minimum cost to raise a child to 18 and how much does it cost to grow a child so uh, yeah, it's an interesting question and prospect. And could you charge interest? The population control is probably where we'll see the sort of thin end of the wedge here. The ability to plan and to organise the human population in a state, you know, to gradually step it down in a way that doesn't necessarily strain the welfare systems or whatever. It's that that's hugely appealing. And this isn't population control in the sense of just just cutting down population. It's literal population control. We need this many people in this decade, so we're going to breed that many people ahead of time, ready to fill that, that need that we anticipate. And this idea of government or corporate crashes raising whole generations of kids, the, the propaganda angle, the, 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 the teaching angle, parental rights. I mean, corporations are considered people in the States. Would they be considered parents? And what level of propaganda and, and how hard would it be to shake if you're raised to only value that corporation or that government from birth? We look at how hard it is for people to break away from religious indoctrination. Even in liberal Western countries, about 75% of people remain in the same religion as their parents or modestly defect slightly from one sect of Christianity to another, for example. So you can see how domineering and controlling propagandizing from birth could be. Other possible effects include, you know, what if we detach parenthood from genetics? What if you ask for a child you meet the qualification and you receive a child, but they may not have your, your genetics. Maybe your genes aren't good enough, however wealthy you might be, however safe and secure your situation might be. You know, it just goes into this common pool where it gets gene typed and matched you know, to avoid inbreeding and so on. This could be a, a big boon in places like Pakistan and, and other nations where marrying your cousin is, is considered okay. You know, so would that lead to a stronger empathy for all children because any child could be your child your biological child or would it lead to increased detachment and less value placed upon children because you have no genetic link necessarily to the child that you have and if we're raising multiples of the same child that increases disease risks and so on because if look, as we as in monocrops, where you have fields and fields of basically genetically identical soybeans or whatever, a blight will wipe out the whole thing. Could this have knock-on effects for disease, or could we engineer in or breed for in these labs and so on? 
resistances to diseases, like AIDS, for example. And if this goes on far enough, could there be a stigma created about natural birth, about how it's dangerous and dirty and primitive? And would this be yet another reason for people in more technologically advanced nations to look down on nations where natural birth remains the norm? Any technology has certain predictable applications and certain unpredictable applications. And reproductive technology has massive social implications. I've lent on the negative here, but I think it's overall, provided we anticipate the negative, I think it's a positive that people could have children without putting strain on their bodies and in a safer, more controlled, directly observed environment where things are even less likely to go wrong. And if we can use this as a method of population control so that there are no unplanned pregnancies, so that we can reproduce at the level that we need to while stepping down our population globally, can only be a positive, I think. But all these other things have to be watched out for. And of course, this technology is a ways away, and there's a lot of ethical questions about it as well. And there will also be a lot of religious and other resistance to such. But it's worth considering the future now to anticipate what's going to happen. Zhang. Sure, you could play one of those hoity-toity horror games where the most horrifying thing that happens is someone wearing a corset who really shouldn't. Or you could grind a zombie's face into a belt sander. <laughs>